Uh, Eduardo Cabral Barreira from Trinity University will talk about geometric ideas on injectivity applied to discrete dynamics. So please. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, the organizers, for the invitation. Uh, as Professor Wright mentioned, this is very new to give uh, these talks on Zoom. And I would like to give two personal comments here. One is, the, even though we've been teaching at Zoom for about a year now, the timing is still a mystery. It's like black magic to me. I know that have, uh, I have here 60 slides. It's probably too long for in person, but in my classes, things seem to go so quick. So this talk could be 30 minutes or three hours. We'll, we'll find out uh, in a bit. And second is, while it is great uh, to have opportunities and, and more equality that we can all access. I mean, seven countries here, people from many different time zones. I do miss uh, talking to people and going for coffee after uh, these talks. Uh, Professor Wright even put an example, uh, a theorem of Hochester that it was given to him in a, in, during a conference, right? And most of my papers here always happen after one of these sessions going to an obscure coffee shop talking to someone and getting an idea. Uh, so we'll see how, how it goes. So thank you for uh, listening. Uh, so let's begin. Uh, I'm at Trinity University. Uh, this is in San Antonio, Texas. Um, uh, but I'm originally from Brazil. Um, I know the conference is in Argentina. We had a interesting weekend. So let's do, talk about math. Oh. Okay. So. Let me tell you about what I'm gonna uh, discuss today. Eight out of 12 talks have Jacobian or Jacobian conjecture in the title. So I felt compelled to write the Jacobian conjecture here because it is what brings all of us together. But I really wanna talk about uh, global injectivity, right? Not necessarily Jacobian conjecture and really use uh, deciding conditions for maps from our end to our end to be injective using geometry and topology. But more importantly, I will be talking about related topics, um, which is detecting global stability. And it is an application of these ideas from global injectivity um, that I, I want to present to you today. So let me begin by talking about what got me motivated, which is this conjecture of Nolot and Xavier, that if you have a local diffeomorphism, it must be injective if the pre-image of every affine hyperplane is connected or the empty set, okay? Now, if true, it would imply the Jacobian conjecture. Personally, it was my motivation uh, as a, 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 my PhD advisor is Professor Xavier, and it was my motivation to enter this area. It was proven false last year by Braun, uh, Professor Gonçalves and Benato Santos. They will give a talk on this session so I'm not gonna uh, discuss too much on this. So let me just tell you how I got involved. And I got involved by proving that if the pre-image of every affine hyperplane is either empty or acyclic, acyclic here means it has a homology of a point, then the map is injective, okay? Now, if you add and non-empty, to the uh, hypothesis, then you can actually prove bijectivity. It is a very nice uh, pictorial proof. It has really kept me busy for several years and it was, it was nice. But then uh, I started thinking about other topics. And in the end, um, I'm, I'm glad Professor uh, Brown, uh, Gonçalves and, and Benato Diaz proved um, uh, Proof that you don't need, you do need for this to be true to have uh, a cyclic connectedness alone would not suffice. Um, okay, so uh, I look forward to see their talk on, I believe, on July 20th, right? That's next Wednesday, no, next Tuesday. Yeah, okay, so perhaps a different conjecture on injectivity. So here is the result of Gilney Kaido that says if you, we consider a rectangular domain in Rn, and if you look at a map of class C1, such that the Jacobian matrix Df is a P matrix, 
that is each principal minor is positive, then F is injective. The conjecture is if all the principal minors do not change sign, then F is injective. So maybe a different conje uh, conjecture on injectivity. So let's look at that. Okay, so we have a prince uh, C1 map such that the Jacobian matrix of P matrix, then it's injective. But does it suffice that it does not change sign? So a theorem by Alexandrov in 94 showed that the result does depend on the geometry of the domain. That if you have the domain to be ellipsoids and such that the uh, Jacobian is a P matrix, the map does not have to be injective. Therefore, what I want to show you today is, OK, so what if we restrict the domain to rectangular like? So here in, in, in R2, what I'm thinking here is this R2 here, this is the bottom square, right? The, this is the unit square, is that when the second component x2 is constant, and here's constant equal to 0, constant equals to 1, and here the first component is constant, and the, second, the first component is constant. So if I have this unit square, that the image of this unit square is rectangular-like, could that be enough? So the complicated hypothesis, the fancy name here is that F will cubically assemble the domain. Well, if you trace through these equations, that's a very fancy way to say that the edges or the faces in the domain, they have a certain normal. When they are mapped, that normal is preserved, right? So it doesn't deform the domain too much. So that's the uh, normal uh, cubically assemblage of the domain, okay? So the result is, if I have a map from R2 to R2, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, sorry, a, a rectangular domain in R2 to R2, a local diffeomorphism of plus C1, if the map cubically assembles uh, the domain, then F is injective. Okay, so the, the preservation of these normals is really what is causing injectivity. And this is a generalization of the gill and theorem in the sense that if the, uh, if the Jacobian matrix is a P matrix, then the image of the edges of the faces of the, the unit cube are indeed preserved. That is the normal of the faces are indeed preserved. They have the, the same direction that you should expect in the image, okay? So the P matrix actually uh, recovers this condition, okay? So, so simply said, a positive principal minors means that normal points in the correct direction. And if it does not vanish, this correct direction will either be in the right orientation, orientation reverse reversing. But most importantly, the normal will not vanish, right? Okay, so the idea then uh, to prove this theorem, the idea is to prove it is injective on the boundary. And this is a very nice result of Castleman from 1971, uh, was in the bulletin of the AMS, a very nice unknown result that says that if you have a map from a, um, an open and local injective map, from a compact set such that the boundary is connected and it is injective when you restrict to the boundary, then the map is injective. So all we need to, to show is that you, we have injectivity on the boundary. All right, so what does that mean? So the conditions on the minors, right? The conditions on the minors tells that the, each, the image of the, the bottom face, the R20, that, that image, is going to be a curve that is going to be the graph of a function. Meaning when it fails to be the graph of a function is that the normal change direction. And the normal assemblage, it's going to mean that no two faces intersect so that we have injective on the boundary. Okay. So one other idea um, is just this idea of what it means to be an exposed point. Uh, 
I, I, I never really saw this written anywhere. It's not a new definition. It's just an observation that if you have a point sometimes um, that belongs to the interior, right? Or it could be in the boundary as well. Uh, here's it's an interior, it could be in the boundary. And I'm gonna call it exposed if that for all points in the interior, right? Then if you if you take a vector, oh, if you take a vector, a unit vector in an array in that direction is going to intersect the boundary. So that point is exposed with respect to that region, right? So, so if you take a point here inside a, a domain, it is going to be exposed if you if it's going to intersect the boundary. Okay. So points over here. Um, over here will not be exposed because they may there are directions that they won't intersect the boundary. All right. Okay. So, oh. so what is the proof? The proof is to show that each image of the edge of this unit square, because it is a graph of a function, cannot intersect each other. So if I fixed one, the image in the red here is the image of the bottom. Okay. So this here is R20. So that's this image. And this image is R21. If they were to intersect, what would happen? They have to intersect at one point, uh, transversality. Um, you can show these things that can be generic. And it would create an exposed point. Once it creates this exposed point, the ray that comes out of it has to intersect the boundary in another point. The boundary has to be the image of one of the edges. So it has to either intersect it again, which means it wouldn't be the graph of a function, or it has to intersect another edge. And then you continue this argument, and that's what you show. You show that the boundaries cannot intersect each other. OK? So it's very nice uh, and, and geometric proof. Um, and that's the idea. And the implementation might be a, a little details in there, but that's the idea that because these the images of the edges are graphs of functions, you cannot wrap around, right? So this is not a function. And that's that's the point. So injectivity does follow from this geometric condition. And the P matrix is the analytic condition that verifies this geometry. That is, the images of the edges are the graphs of functions. Okay. Now, the new conjecture is that I'm proposing here is that if you have a local diffeomorphism from Rn, from a cube in Rn, if it, the, the, the map normally cubic assembles the domain, then f is injective. I began thinking of this many years ago. Uh, no, I, just, I published this in 2018, I believe. And at the time that I, I, I think of it, and I still go to bed thinking about it, I often wake up thinking it, it's true. I, I can picture for R3 being true. But when I write it down, I, I start re-picturing in the morning when I'm uh, more uh, rested that it doesn't quite work. But I, I do believe this is true. Almost every night when I go to bed, this got to be true. Um, but I haven't been able to prove. So maybe someone here uh, could think about this. But if this to have more intersections of these edges, it's going to have to fail the property of being a graph. And that's what the normal is capturing. Um, I imagine that once you get the proof down for R3, um, it, it will work. The notation uh, um, also will, will, will help. I, I'm not sure, but that's the conjecture. And of course, this would imply the gil nikaido conjecture, because it's normally assemblage really is not, it's about being graphs. And it doesn't matter if, uh, if the orientation, it just matters it is a graph of a function, okay? So the idea is here now, a small pause. We, I, we start thinking from the Jacobian conjecture for images of hyperplanes to this gilney Kaido where I'm starting looking at normal vectors. Now, a hyperplane, it's uniquely defined by normal vector. So if I'm thinking about the preimage of a hyperplane, maybe I can look at the preimage of a normal, and that's kind of the same thing. So I started thinking about 
primitive of hyperplanes in terms of normal vectors and, and so on. And that, weirdly enough, was motivated by a question from a colleague. He gave me a map and wanted to find a reasonable domain where the map is invertible or injective. So this needs more explanation, but this got me started on the related problems, right? So Jacobian conjecture, global injectivity, and now related problems. That it changed a little bit my research, but it kept the injectivity mindset. And that's what I want to highlight uh, uh, for you today, and maybe show that it's related to this uh, new conjecture. So I started thinking about the discrete, discrete dynamical systems. So if you have a continuous map uh, from the positive cone to the positive cone, because these maps will come from biology, so uh, it has to be no negative uh, elements. So a fixed point is just f of x equals x. Uh, we say that a point is asymptotically stable if the orbits of any other point right, uh, nearby will remain near and is attracting if it eventually attracts any point the limit uh, uh, orbit of any point will be x star, okay? So the question is, when is a fixed point globally asymptotically stable? So we're looking at orbits of points and we wanna see when they are attracting, right? When the asymptotically stable means, right? So there's a, the neighborhood that uh, is attracting and attracting it goes to that point. So when is a fixed point globally asymptotically stable? In one dimension, to have discrete uh, dynamics and population. So these are three important biological models. Uh, the logistic model, I uh, hope I imagine everyone have seen it at some point in some um, course. Um, so that's the logistic model. Uh, the Ritter model, uh, developed by a Canadian mathematician thinking about fish population. And the Beverton Holt model, um, also population dynamics. In all of these, of course, you have that the fitness of the population, the next generation divided by the current generation is a decreasing function. So here, the decreasing function, the fitness is just a line for the logistic. For the Ricker model is just an exponential and the beverton holt is a rational function, right? So you find a nice decreasing function that has, that fits some, some data then you get your name to one of these models. And there are plenty of those, right? So in one dimension, you have these nice cobweb diagrams. So the, the Ricker model is asymptotically stable, right? So you have, it converges to the fixed point. This is the famous cobweb. So that's for the parameter R is 0 0.75. If R is greater than one, but less than two, it still converges, but now oscillates. Right? So this discrete dynamics analysis, this dynamical systems, you have these famous bifurcation diagrams that this is the parameter space, this is the parameter, parameter R, right? So it means when R is between zero and two, you have only one fixed point, right? You have one fixed point. And once R is greater than two, you have what is called a bifurcation point. Now you have two fixed points and then uh, sorry, period two points, right? So it starts oscillating. And so it's period doubling. So you have these bifurcations until you get chaos, period three, three implies chaos. And there you have it. Okay. The Ricker map, the bifurcation diagram is similar to the logistic map. And there's a famous folkloric result that these, they are topological equivalents. Okay. But some observations. In the Ricker map, there is a critical point at one. The fixed point is at R, which is the reproduction rate. And it suffices to consider this domain, zero to one. What it means, if you take any point in the image, there is a point inside zero one that matches that point. So if I started looking at the dynamics on a point here outside zero one, right? There is a point that matches it here. So I, I might as well start the dynamics on this point. So the fundamental domain that I need to look at is the domain from zero to one. 
which is a domain where the map, the derivative does not vanish and the map is invertible. So this is the fundamental domain. Same thing when R is greater than one, even though the fixed point is outside of zero and one, I only need to look at the orbits of points inside zero one, right? So that is the motivation here. That is any point outside zero one comes from the pre-image of a point inside zero one. So my initial domain is zero one, where the map is invertible. Okay, that's the observation. Oh. What happened here? I'm, so, I'm sorry, what happened? Yeah, okay. So for R between zero and one, the map is called monotone and the orbits go in inc decreasing to the fixed point or if you start in a point after the fixed point, it goes decreasing. So that's a monotone map, right? So the orbits are increasing or decreasing, but they will converge to the fixed point. So if the map is monotone, it is easy to show asymptotic stability, global asymptotic stability. When the map is, when R is greater than one, but less than two, it's a little more difficult, but you can still show that the map is global asymptotic stable. Okay, now let's go to the plane, right? So 1D, we know everything. No, we don't know everything. There's a lot of open questions there, but I'm now worried about the in dimension two and in higher dimensions. So in dimension two, we have competition in two species, and we assume they compete uh, with the, uh, the Ricker population model. Each species has a uh, uh, reproductive rate R and S, both greater than zero. A and B are the intra-competition between the species, okay? So the way one species goes after one generation can be dependent on the second species, okay? Uh, in this map, we can view this as a discrete dynamical systems of F, uh, this map right here, so it's simpler to see. And this map F has one fixed point at the origin, that's an extinction point, two exclusion points, and a possible coexistence point, okay? Um, X star and Y star, but it's a positive coexistence point. So the dynamics here is that you have a fixed point at the origin. When one species goes to extinction, so if Y n is zero here, suppose this, this happens, so this is just a one dimensional Ricker map. So, so that's the, the dynamics here. And then you have one fixed point and possibly one point here. And that possibly point requires that this AB is less than one, okay? All right, so in dimension two, you can also talk about the bifurcation diagram. And now you have two parameter space. These regions here on the bottom is when the dynamics of the map, here is the X variable, here's the Y variable, they, any orbit of the point will be excluded. So these excluded regions. So when the parameters are here, you have an exclusion principle. So the bifurcation diagram it is the projection of the diagram that I showed you earlier in the R parameter. And the color me means here is period one, period two, period doubling, and you have eventually chaos. Okay, so for each color is the, the number of periods that I, the bifurcation diagram that I showed you just to take the projection. In the middle here, it will be the bifurcation to the fixed point for the interior fixed point. And what we know is that there is this region where you have local stability, not global, but local. And then you have period doubling, tripling. And these results, the local stability uh, S1 is proven, but S2, S3, this is computational, right? So the, uh, you, you do a, a, a Mathematica, so you take your favorite software and you find when you have period doubling and so on. And, but we know that you have this uh, hyperbola right here. Okay. Now, let me give away the end in a way. So we can show that for the Ricker map between one and two, as we had in one dimensions, in two dimensions, it is global asymptotically stable with some conditions. 
Okay, so we can extend to two dimensions. So this uses an injectivity result. That's what I want to highlight today. I can also show in that between zero and one, this map is monotone. And that uses that, the, these ideas of looking at the normal vectors from Gale Nikaido. Again, from injectivity ideas. Um, and this works not only in the plane, which was already known, but in higher dimensions. And that really is a contribution here. Um, so I've been thinking about this way before that for these Gil Nikaido things, but I, I thought that I was always going to be able to prove the RN conjecture, but I figure it's time to pass the torture. Someone else should think about it. Uh, I, okay. All right. And then you have these mixed regions that we don't know. And why are they mixed? Again, let I'm go ahead and, and give the, the end result. The reason we can do these, these two red regions is that we can find regions of invertibility. It's nice and invertible results that we have there. Once you have these mixed regions, you have to cross of, uh, of regions where the map is non-invertible. And that's it's a lot more difficult, right? Because we all want to think about injectivity. Um, that's what we dedicate to think. But in these question marks, the map may not be invertible. And there's no way of uh, getting around it. So let me show you how injectivity plays a role in the uh, study of uh, discrete dynamics. So just as we look at one dimensions, we need to look at the critical point. So the critical point, we need to look at the Jacobian matrix, look at the determinant of the Jacobian matrix, and from the French, or even Portuguese, the critical lines, uh, linea critica, and it's just when the determinant is equal to zero. And you have these, uh, this equation where x cannot be uh, 1 over 1 minus ab. And remember, the condition is that ab is less than 1. So the critical curves is going to be two branches of this hyperbola. Here is branch number 1, and here is branch number 2. And for some reason, classically, they begin with negative 1, even though it should be 0, right? But they begin with negative 1. So you have these two critical curves. The image here of this curve is this, okay? The image of this curve is here. And then this, there is a point here, which is what is called a cusp. And then this rest goes here, okay? And this is uh, the usual domain. So what we really want to know is that, that is it suffice to study this map just in this, do, in this domain here, just inside the critical set? What happens with the function past the critical set? When I look at the orbits of every point and the fixed point is gonna be somewhere around here, what happens to the images of these critical curves? How does the, these interact? Is this picture here correct? Shouldn't it, maybe this, uh, excuse me, uh, maybe this guy here could be, over here, why does this work in this nice little picture? So let's find out. But first, let's look at the case where the function is monotone, just as we did in one dimension, right? We have pointwise convergence. So a function is monotone if it preserves some order, right? So increasing or decreasing functions in, a, in this sense. So when you look at monotone in higher dimensions, you need an orthant to generate an order, right? So the usual order is just less or equal, but you can have any order. In one dimension, you just have less or, or greater or equal than. But in higher dimensions, let's say planar maps, you can have the northeast order or the southeast order. The northeast order, Q1, is when maps are co cooperative. So they grow, both grow, in the same direction, in the positive order. A map can also be what we call competitive. If one variable increases, the other one decreases. And this makes sense, right? If you think about competition between two species, if one does better, then the other one must lose, right? So if one, one increases and the other decreases, that is called the K order or Q4 order or the Southwest, Southeast quadrant uh, order, All right? So a few more terms in, in, in this uh, area. 
you have that the planar map satisfies its O plus when it satisfies the preservation of order, but going backwards. So you do need invertibility of F, right? In a region is K convex, if every line joining into points are order with respect to K plus. So to be K convex, we really mean things to look like this, that you have these curves that are increasing in the X direction and decreasing in the Y direction. So these are the K convex. Now, a uh, very important theorem in this era is a pro, uh, theorem of Hal Smith in our, um, that says that if you have a planar map competitive, such that O plus holds, then the orbits of a point will be eventually component-wise monotone. So if the orbit has compact closure, then it must converge because it is going to be com component-wise monotone. Okay. So monotone, a competitive map in the sense is the one that it really the orbits will be component-wise monotone. So you can recover the, the idea of one dimension of a bounded sequence, right? The monotone sequence will converge. So you have a convergence to a fixed point. In practice, what you really need to show is that this region is k-convex. Okay, that's fine. The determinant is positive. Okay, that's an easy computation. The Jacobian has this signs, it's plus plus along the diagonal and minus in the off diagonal terms. But more importantly, the map has to be globally injected. The map has to be injected. All right. So that's all this talk, uh, I guess 10, 15 minutes already on, on discrete dynamics. And we got to the point, okay, here's where injectivity comes in. So the theorem of Hal Smith is that if you look at the Rick, the planar Ricker map, where zero R, the, uh, the reproductive rates R and S is between zero and one, just as in one dimension, then F is competitive and the unique positive coexistence fixed point is global asymptotically stable. Okay, so the Ricker map between zero and one is global asymptotically stable. So that's great. So if you have here zero, R and S less than one, then the map is competitive or monotone. What happens is the image of the critical curve falls inside and the fixed point is global asymptotically stable. Okay, that's great. However, the domain that Hal Smith uses in his paper contains a critical curve and F is not injective. So the result does not apply. In a way, uh, when I first began in this area, this was a paper that everyone cited, and he refers to a preprint. Um, I had a chance in, in a conference. Again, I hope uh, uh, very soon we get back to start in person conference. And I uh, asked Professor Smith, how, how does your proof work? Because it requires injectivity, but the map is not injective. And it is an unpublished preprint. Uh, later, he showed me uh, his proof, but I'm actually glad that he never showed me this proof because it's really, that's how I start thinking about this. Wait, wait a minute, this proof has to work, has to work, but the function has to be injective. So we need to prove injectivity, okay? So it is very cited, but it, it wasn't correct. He has the proof, but it wasn't published in that paper. Um, so I wanna, I wanna make very clear. He has had the original proof, but it wasn't a preprint, okay? So, I want to establish global stability, uh, planar Ricker map, and understanding monotonicity in the plane and beyond really was proving injectivity for that Ricker map that I just showed you. And here is the geometric intuition related now to the Gilnikaido normals. Here is a monotone curve, and here is a non monotone. Monotone means that the normals are pointing in the same direction, and non monotone the normal change direction. So that's the observation. So if you uh, just want to pay attention to this part, it's simply the realization that monotone really means that the normals are pointing always in the same direction, pointing in the same quadrant. They're always positive vectors. So in higher dimension, you can just say, you can consider hypersurface, a hyperplane. You can look at the normal vector, and I'm going to say that the map is normally monotone 
such that if you take a hypersurface such that the normals are positive, positive as positive vectors, then the image of that hypersurface, the normals will also be positive. So that is a normally monotone map. Okay, it's a map that preserves normal. Geometrically, all that means is it preserves the structure of graphs, the same graph structure again, right? Normally monotone is equivalent to being competitive. So in, in the plane in two dimensions, those, those are the same, okay? So now when we look at global stability in higher dimensions, we have to now look what are the assumptions in higher dimensions that, uh, that we want. So we want to look at competition maps. So you want these Komogorov maps, right? Which are invariance on the axis. So if one species goes to extinction, this component might, might as well not exist. So the domain is a monotone region such that the map when restricted to that domain is monotone. Um, in each coordinate map, the, there is a, a unique interior point, which is gonna be stable. And the map admits a carrying simplex. So these are a lot of uh, definitions. And if you've never seen that, it may seem technical. I'll, I'll, of course, I'll give Professor Brown my, my slides if he wants to share with anyone, but let me show you some pictures what this uh, means. Well, so here's the result. So if it satisfies H1 to H4, then you can prove global asymptotic stability. The proof is geometric. It's iterative. I'm going to show you dimension two. And it can be analytic, uh, analytically verified just as a Hal Smith's uh, result. And for planar maps, we do not require the carrying simplex. Okay, so here's a proof. So suppose you have this type of map. The origin is a repeller. In, in when you fix the dimension here, it is a saddle point. It is a attractive in one dimension. It is a saddle point when you look at these E1s and E2 in the whole domain. We want to prove that if the map is monotone, E star is global asymptotically stable. So how do we do that? So monotonicity will imply that the unstable manifold will contain E star, that is, that if you continue taking the unstable manifold, you're gonna go to E star. That is sometimes called a heteroclinic orbit, right? The fixed points in the boundary uh, and the interior fixed point form a heteroclinic orbit. In the plane, this is not difficult to prove. In higher dimensions, I need the Karen simplex. So if anyone here has experience with dynamical systems and uh, no easy, uh, easy conditions to know about heteroclinic orbits, that is really all I need. I don't need that H4, I just need a heteroclinic orbit. So now, how do I prove global stability? Pick any point and pick a path, okay? So pick a point nearby. This point is a saddle, so locally, so if I pick a point very close to the boundary, so it has to go here, it has to go near the unstable manifold and has to go up, right? That's a saddle point. So this point has to eventually be here. And a point here closer to this edge also has to eventually be over here, okay? So that's from the local structure. So we can do that, all right? Now what happens? This piece is a graph of a function because it has positive normal. The map is monotone, so the images, this must, the normal must be preserved. So this must, must stay inside this rectangle because the image in red here must be the graph of a function. So must be inside this rectangle. And you might as well uh, show that it's inside some ball, radius epsilon. If this ball is the, is, uh, so once it gets close enough for any epsilon, we can do that, then it's global asymptotically stable. So we prove that the image of every point goes inside the ball. And you repeat this construction in higher dimensions, but instead of looking at curves, you consider uh, sphere caps. So just uh, regions, the boundaries of hypersurfaces that are monotone. And that the fact that the normal is positive shows that you have this graph preservation 
And if it is a graph, it has to be inside this cube. And that's it. So in higher dimensions, you can check. And the condition to check monotone that I want to highlight is that the, the term, uh, the inverse of the Jacobian matrix is positive. And you can view this as the principal minors are positive when the map is orientation preserving. Okay. Then the other conditions for saddle, you have to look at the eigenvalues of the points in the axis. In the Karen simplex, uh, there's also some analytic conditions. Let's, uh, I'm not going to dwell on that right now. But the highlight here is that you have an, a nice analytic condition that checks monotonicity. Okay. And then you can now look at the maps that previously were not considered monotone, but now under this point of view are monotone and they are globally uh, stable. One is it Leslie Gower, which is the extension of the Beverton Holt model in, in, in one dimension. So this is monotone. It in 2012 showed that it has a Karen simplex and there is a positive fixed point. We can also look at the 3D Ricker model. Same thing. Uh, now, nice enough that the parameters are between zero and one, that the map is monotone. It also has a current simplex in higher dimensions and is uh, as positive to not stable. Okay. And now, under this definition, we can show that the Ricker map is, uh, is monotone and it has a right domain. So, where is the injectivity coming in? Well, before I reveal that, let me just say that Hirsch. In, in this area, he defined com, com, competitive maps in higher dimensions. That, that was classically done, but he defines that an increase in one competitors have a negative effect on all species. And he views that as the Jacobian matrix have positive diagonal, literally extending this the, uh, in the two-dimensional positive diagonal and off diagonal negatives. So that uh, how Hirsch generalized that idea for competitive in higher dimensions. And what we're proposing here is that we can prove monotonicity in higher dimensions, saying that the competition means if someone wins, someone loses. You don't have to have everybody losing, right? But you cannot have everybody winning. One win, at least one, someone else loses. And what that means is that the Jacobian matrix has a positive inverse, okay? The Jacobian matrix is a positive inverse. Positive inverse in the sense that the entries of the inverse of the Jacobian matrix are all positive. Okay. All right. So now let's go back to the, the monotone and why the Richter map is indeed injective. So I showed you this picture earlier for the planar map. And I, that's the picture. And this has what I call the usual geometry, meaning the image um, of the region R1 is indeed bounded by this critical curve LC01. This curve here, LC minus one, two, goes inside LC01. We do have this cusp, okay? And the, uh, this, this curve here, uh, this one, one, right? So this curve is here. When it's greater than one, it goes on the outside, but when it's monotone, it goes inside. And it is the usual geometry in the sense that none of these um, are, are, are observed. It has to be this one, okay? So to show that, we have to go back to the theory of Whitney on singularity theory, okay? Where he defines a map being good and this notion of being good and a map to be excellent, right? Uh, map being good means the determinant of Jacobian is different than zero and the gradient is different than zero and it's excellent right a point is excellent point of a good map if it's regular a fold or a cusp point okay and a map is excellent if it's excellent at every point so in dimension two what we have is from the theory of whitney we understand how singularities occur if you have a fold point by the fold point, you have what you what you would do if you fold a piece of paper. You have this uh, parabola that you gets folded, and a cusp 
is a cusp that you have. If you take your, your shirt or napkin and you give it a cusp point, that is exactly uh, how it looks like. All right. So you we do some um, some algebra, and we show that the Ricard map is excellent. All the points in the lower critical curve are folds, and there is one cusp point. More importantly, that the cusp point will determine the location of the image of the curve. Okay. So when you draw this, it is indeed a cusp, and it's right here. Okay. Then the map can be restricted only to this region R1, and it is a homomorphism in this region. Okay. An application from the Castle, Castleman theorem from before tells you that all you need to do now is to show that the map is injective on the boundary. Now, the boundary is invariant. And so all we need to show is that LC0 does not intersect itself. And that is not too complicated. But more importantly, now we can show that the image of the cusp point is inside LC0. It doesn't go outside. And it doesn't go outside because the image of the cusp point, if you go through in the fundamental structure of, of Whitney, it will give you an, an exposed point. And because at an exposed point is gonna, sorry, this point here gonna have to, to exit. So it has to intersect the boundary and the boundary have to be LC01. So it has to be inside again, because it has to be exposed. Okay. So once we know it is exposed, we have this picture. Every point here in R2 gets folded inside R1. Every point in the red region stay, it goes in the red region, which is inside the blue region. Therefore, the analysis of the Ricard map does not need to be done on the unit square. Can needs to be done only inside the, re, the blue region. So in the monotone case, you do the analysis inside that region, which was what Hal Smith really intended to do in the first place, right? You, you don't have to look at this region, but he couldn't prove injectivity of the map. He uses a different technique, but now we can prove injectivity inside this region. That's all you need. And you have a consequence here in the non-invertible uh, case. Uh, you can show, you can you have a theorem that all you need to understand now is the dynamics of these critical curves, okay? Uh, when we originally published the theorem, uh, we have all critical curves. We have to hypothesize that they do not intersect, but Rouse and Sakura show that you only needed two curves. And what happens is, sorry, I'm going quick here, but now what happens was, yeah. So here is, is the domain. You, you do the classical analysis looking at isoclines. Uh, the region, the blue region is going to be inside this isocline. So every point, the blue region will eventually be here outside the critical curve, and you show that the critical curves will converge and squeeze uh, the domain, okay? So all you need to consider is the blue point. Every point here in blue will eventually be here, which means that every point in blue will eventually be in between these two curves, and this is the only region of interest, and you show that this region is getting squeezed, and you prove global stability, okay? so. A uh, fundamental problem here was we needed a region of invertibility, a region of fundamental domain, where it could take the pre-images, go back and forth to show global stability, which is required for this type of results, okay? All right. Now, so currently we have been revisiting planar competitive maps in applications of biological system. And this is because in biological systems, we want to look at periodic maps, okay? So uh, we want to extend global stability to periodic systems by framing as a problem of inject injectivity. Uh, a few years ago, um, we had um, uh, a conference on, international conference on discrete e uh, equations, dis discrete dynamic systems. I believe that this conference was in either Romania or Poland where people looking at uh, periodic maps such that all maps share the same fixed point and doing analysis that way. 
So the idea here is, can we do for maps that are periodic, but they may not necessarily share the same fixed point? All right, so the maps I'm looking at, they're gonna come from biological assumptions, which is basically that Ricker map that has this general idea that the map is competitive. You have the extinction point, right? Um, uh, as a repeller, no one is here. You have a point here, which is a saddle. And then you may have a coexistence fixed point and you wanna know, will this point be an attractor? So for this point to be, so that's the general uh, framework. And for this coexistence fixed point to be unique, that's really an injectivity uh, assumption. Because if it's interior point, I wanna know when this is equal, uh, when this is equal to X, Y. Well, if it's positive, I can remove the X and Y. So this is equal to one, one. So I wanna know, does it have a solution? And is the solution unique? So let's call this the reduced map, okay? And our new hypothesis is this reduced map is injected, okay? So on this new hypothesis, that it's easy to show that if you have H1 to H4, that interior fixed point is global asymptotically stable. So the question here now is, if you have a periodic system, okay, if the individual maps are global asymptotically stable, is the system global asymptotically stable? Well, sort of. If FN is competitive, I say that global asymptotical stability is a simple problem of injectivity. And here the word simple is very generous. It is a hard problem of injectivity, but that's it. Why? Because the theorems, what we need to show is that if the each function satisfies H1, then the periodic system also satisfies, okay? The competitiveness is trivial, right? Because uh, competitive, it's about the derivative the inverse of Jacobin being positive. And if you have two maps whose inverse, inverse of the Jacobin is positive, the composition by the chain rule will also share that positiveness. So that's, that was the, the real problem uh, before, but now it's almost trivial. H3, H3 is just a settle point. That's just a computation. You compute the eigenvalue of the fixed point there. So, okay, that's, that, that can be complicated, but it's just computation. H4 now is an application of Gilnikaido. So I hope you see that by always thinking about Gilnikaido and, 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 and those things, all these things are related and it's just trying to find other related problems, right? But it is really Gilnikaido. And the open problem here is if you have these reduced maps are injective, when is the composition also injective? Okay. And it is really an application of Gilnikaido. We can do this in, in, in applications. Um, and I think that's all I, I want to talk about. Maybe I did go a little too fast or maybe not. But thank you so much uh, for listening. Appreciate it. Thank you. So uh, thank you. Eduardo, uh, we can we can we have time for for one question and then we go to, to coffee. Yeah. So, please. Any questions? I I I have just a question. Uh, uh, you talked about the Ricker. Richer map or weaker. Uh, can you can you do the same theorem for the logistic? I mean, same. I don't know, but uh, similar theorems for the logistic. The, Did the, this, the, this, uh... Yes. So um, so let me just say one thing. Absolutely. So the logistic, when you do simulations for the logistic, you have this, uh, what I call this usual geometry. Uh, this okay. Here. Yes. The issue of the logistic is the following. You're going to have polynomial maps in those equations to prove that the map is excellent. 
right? Yes. Yes. That one, the algebra gets complicated. In the Ricker map, it's exponential to polynomial. When you take the derivative, well, you get that polynomial back. So the degree one here, you got a degree one. In the Ricker map, in the logistic map, the equations are much more complicated, even though they're still polynomials. Okay. Um, so honestly, the wrench here to extend this in general, uh, well, to extend to the logistic and for other equations is just the algebra of proving this type of result that is excellent. Because you have to, what you have to do is you have to parametrize the critical curve. You have to look at the equation here. So, um, to this equation. So you have to understand what the critical curve is mm -hmm. for the logistic map. Okay. I, I also I would, I would like to say that I, I have a tendency to think about these proofs very geometrically. And the original proof in, in the paper that, that, that I had was using this idea of exposed points. It was somewhat complicated, what I think was uh, to be more general. And one of the collaborators was able to use Mathematica and simplify these equations and use really a nice artifact of Mathematica to, to understand this. And I imagine someone very clever uh, and algebraically apt can show this for the logistic. I, I have not yet, but uh, another, another uh, point here is I mentioned the folkloric uh, result that the Ricker map is topological equivalent to the logistic. I've never seen it anywhere. And in one dimension, everyone says, sure, that's true. But in two dimensions, people are a little more reluctant to say it is true. Okay. Uh, again, if anyone knows, I would love to know uh, the proof that topological equivalence. Thank you. So let's thank the speaker. <laughs> and uh, let's go to the coffee break. <laughs> and uh, we resume at... Uh, in 13 minutes, 13 minutes, okay?